Good afternoon. Uh, Division 3 is absolutely delighted to be here, and now you see the panel for the last matter of the day. Uh, this is Justice Edgerton, Justice Donna Dina, and myself, Justice Lee Edmond. So we're calling matter number six to Haviland versus FX Networks. Good afternoon, Justice Edmond. I'm Kelly Klaus. On behalf of the appellants, I would like to reserve six minutes of my time, and I'll try to keep track of it with my clock. All right. Let me um, tell you if I could. I'm inclined to take uh, the argument in the following order, having you start and then letting the amicus go. We've, we've got one amicus counsel who has requested oral argument, followed by the plaintiff and respondent, and then you can wrap up at the end. Does that make sense? Terrific. Okay. Terrific. Thank you, Your Honors. And may it please the court. Plaintiff's claims in this case for false light and breach of the right of publicity are meritless under California law and the First Amendment. They should have been stricken under the anti-slap statute. And if the plaintiff's claims in this case can't be stricken in the case of a docudrama, then it's hard to imagine any living plaintiff, any living person, whose claims would, sur would, would not survive an anti-slap motion in this context. Feud, the underlying work, is a docudrama. It dramatizes the history of a rivalry between two actresses that captivated the public image for decades. The plaintiff in this case, Olivia de Havilland, was no stranger to that rivalry. She played a pivotal role in the events that, the, that, that Feud dramatizes, including her friendship with Betty Davis, and her replacing Joan Crawford on the movie Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte in 1964. She was a real person who played a real role in these historical events. No parts of her claims we submit can survive the high standards for establishing either the element of a provably false statement for defamation that rises to the level of being highly offensive to the reasonable person or the high and demanding standard of convincing clarity to show actual malice for her defamation claim. With respect to the right of publicity claim, it's our position that plaintiff's claim cannot be squared with any of the tests that may apply, whether it's the Guglielmi case, whether it's the transformative test of the Comedy Three Partners case, or whether it's the public interest exception um, that, is, that, that is embedded both within Section 33 44 and the common law and the common law. I'd like to start with the false light claim, uh, the elements of the false light claim, and then turn to the right of publicity action. With respect to the false light claim, there are, I read it through the briefs, appears to be four elements or four four matters that the plaintiff claims places her into a false light. One of them is that the feud portrays her as a gossip because it shows her giving an imagined interview, which is part of the storytelling device that the show uses to set the backdrop and to start the narrative for the story. A second is a claim that by having uh, the character based on Mr. Haviland give the interview at all, Viewed projects falsely that she participated in and endorsed the project. The third is that her two uses of the word bitch in the course of 18 minutes out of 400 minutes of the total series in which she is in, um, that those few seconds portray her as a vulgarian, which she says puts her into a false light. And the fourth is that uh, in the context of her, the character making a joke to liven Betty Davis's spirits on the night of the, uh, the Oscars for the 1963 Best Actress, that she made a joke at Frank Sinatra's expense about his having drunk all the booze in the dressing room. With respect to all four of those elements, or those, those matters, we would submit they fail at every level of the, the test for both the common law rules for false light and the constitutional overlay that comes from the fact that as plaintiff admits she is a public figure and that matters discussed and that the matters that are discussed in feud are matters of public interest. Um, the first element is whether there is a provably false statement 
That is a question for the court to decide. And in the context of a docudrama, we have guidance from this court in the Broder case, from the U.S. Supreme Court in the Masson case, from the Ninth Circuit in the Partington case, and from numerous other courts that say that docudramas are understood not to be a literal retelling of history. That is the role of a documentary. The docudrama necessarily, as the courts have said, partakes of the author's license to compress events, to take literary license with respect to presenting uh, his historical matters in ways that fit with the theme of the project and that, and that deal with the amount of time that someone has. And so when one looks at when one looks at the claim that, that this de Havilland was placed in a false light by being characterized as a gossip, it's important to start from the, from the background that the, the, the entire work is a docudrama. And therefore, we would submit under those cases, just the, the, the imputation simply isn't there given the general tenor of the work. With respect to the specific context, it's notable that plaintiff doesn't really describe what it is that purportedly shows her as a gossip that she was not during her real life, during the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and beyond. There's no, st there's, the plaintiff doesn't point to actual lines of dialogue in which the de Havilland character is telling secrets about various people or is gossiping in the way that there is another character in Feud, the, the legendary uh, columnist Hedda Hopper, who is a bona fide gossip, who is shown along with Betty Davis and Joan Crawford feeding lots and lots of dirt. And there is none of that that is coming out of Miss de Havilland's mouth. The character appears primarily in the scenes that I think are alleged to show her to be a gossip as one of a number of historical narrators, a very common device that goes all the way back to Citizen Kane and perhaps even earlier in movies and in, and in works that, that illustrate the lives of particular people. It shows her giving a narrative overview of who Betty Davis was, of who Joan Crawford was. It shows, it shows the de Havilland character talking about issues that we know in fact, were of importance to Ms. de Havilland. Things like the glass ceiling in the motion picture industry, the, limit, the limited roles for women in the motion picture industry. And it shows her and other characters, uh, including characters based on the actor Victor Bono, uh, characters, uh, the actress Joan Blondell, and even Joan Crawford's maid. <laughs> in the series shows up as someone who is, is seen as, as propelling the, the narrative forward in these comments. But no real, no real example of anything that is, is shown to be gossip or something that places her we would submit in a false light. With respect to if there were, we'd submit that on the second element that the claim would fail because Mr. Haviland has not shown that the sorts of things that she has shown saying in the entire context of her presentation would be highly offensive. In fact, by my count, and it's a rough count, I admit, that of the 18 minutes in which she's in the series, the lines of dialogue that are claimed to be highly offensive amount to less than 30 seconds, I believe. They are quite fleeting. Overall, Mr. Haviland is shown in an incredibly positive light. She's shown being a loyal confidant to Betty Davis, to being a wise counselor to her, telling her not to stoop to the level of Joan Crawford and to, to, to get mired in the mud. So we think that there's simply no way to characterize this as a highly offensive portrayal. Finally, if the plaintiff could get past the falsity element and the, and the, and the defamatory meaning element, she would have to clear the high hurdle of actual malice. And actual malice in a case like this, a case where there are two possible implications under the plaintiff's theory of, of the statements and the characterizations at issue, one of which is entirely innocent, 
and the other of which is the plaintiff's characterization, which this portrays her in a, bad, in, in a bad way. Once someone has an abundance of information about Ms. de Havilland that's not apparent on the face of the statement, that where one has a defamation by implication case, what good government and numerous cases that have followed it make clear is that in order to prevail on actual malice, it's not enough as the trial court in this case said, that the, that the producers of feud did not, knew that Mr. Havilland did not actually give an interview backstage at the Academy Awards in 1978. What they instead have to show is clear and convincing evidence, much higher than a preponderance, that they either, that the producers either deliberately cast the statements in such a way as to put Mr. Havilland in the claim negative light, or they engaged in what the law calls reckless disregard and defines to mean having actually subjectively entertained very serious doubts that the average viewer of feud would take the, would take the presentation to have the incredibly negative meaning that the, that the plaintiff alleges. And that standard applies even though it's an anti-slap motion? It uh, definitely applies even though it is an anti-slap motion. Under the Christian Research case, Christian Research Institute case, and under the Rodriguez case from this district, which the plaintiffs themselves have cited and said supplies the appropriate standard, both of them say that in the anti-slap context, the plaintiff has to, has to satisfy that heightened standard. They say this, that the, the, the plaintiff must satisfy the actual malice standard and that the standard of review by the Court of Appeal is not the customary or substantial deference standard, but it is a, it's a standard that is mandated by the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in the Bose case. It's a standard of independent review because the actual factual matters that are, at, that are at issue with respect to the actual malice determination implicate matters of constitutional law. And it's not, it, it's not enough just to say I've pointed to something. Now in this case, I don't think we have to even get to the standard with respect to actual malice of whether or not she has met a, a clear and convincing evidence standard, of whether or not there is independent review or anything to defer to because there is literally no evidence in the record, none, that the defendants in this case subjectively entertained any serious doubt about, what, about the, the portrayal that they were providing of Ms. de Havilland. This is explained at length in Mr. Murphy's declaration, in Mr. Meneer's declaration, in the declaration of Mr. Zam, who wrote the underlying screenplay for Best Actress, where he talked about the reasons for including an Olivia de Havilland character along with a number of other characters of that period in motion picture history as the narrators. And what the, what the creators have said is that they tried to present Ms. de Havilland in an extraordinarily positive way. They wanted her to be someone who would soften the hard edges of Betty Davis to be someone who would be seen as, as a, as they put it, as an authoritative bridge to the audience. They did not want to portray her as a gossip. They meant to portray her as, as a, in, in a very positive light. And we'd submit that when one watches the entirety of the work here, all eight episodes, that's exactly the way that Ms. de Havilland, I think, comes, comes across to, and would come across to the, to the average viewer. So that's with respect to gossip. Let me touch on the, 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 remaining, uh, the remaining remarks. One is the, word, the use of the word bitch. Both times in a private context, once on a telephone conversation between the de Havilland character and the Betty Davis character, and the other time on a telephone conversation between the de Havilland character and her home in Switzerland, and the director, Robert Aldrich, calling from Los Angeles to beg her to, to take the part in Hush, Hush, Sweet Charlotte. Um, with respect to the, 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 the element of falsity, we'd submit the show simply does not portray Mr. Havilland as a vulgarian. They don't, simply because it does not show her at every moment 
as we've said, speaking as a saint doesn't mean that it shows her as someone or portrays her as someone who swore like a sailor. Simply didn't happen. The, the, and the, the incidents that are at issue here, the first one being the, the one with the conversation with Ms. Davis where she says, makes the comment, do you know what my bitch sister has been telling the press that I broke her collarbone? So the accusation by Ms. de Havilland's sister, the actress Joan Fontaine, with whom she had her own legendary feud and which was one of the artistic reasons for including the de Havilland character in this series. We know from Ms. Fontaine's biography that she did make the assertion that when they were children, Ms. de Havilland broke her collarbone. We know from Ms. de Havilland's interviews just within the last couple of years that there was no love loss, that there was a great deal of, that there was a, a great deal of fraughtness that consumed this relationship between these women for better than 60 years. That she referred to her as Dragon Lady. And we know from Mr. Murphy's declaration that the reason that he, 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 he testified he had seen the interview, he had seen the, 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 the footage of Ms. de Havilland actually using the word bitch. We know it crossed her lips during the course of her life. And he said he made an artistic judgment. He used artistic license because he thought it would resonate with a contemporary audience to use the word bitch in place of dragon lady. Um, again, nothing we would submit that could qualify as either a provably false statement that she was a Bulgarian, that it is highly offensive in 2017 to portray someone as having used that particular word on two fleeting occasions, and nothing that rises to the level of actual malice. The other incident that I'll just refer to, which is the telephone conversation with Robert Aldrich, um, that the, almost the exact words, <laughs> I don't play bitches, they make me so unhappy. That has been attributed to Mr. Haviland for nearly 30 years. In Mr. Considine's book, The Divine Feud, which was, one of the, which was one of the key source materials that Mr. Zam and that the creators of Feud relied on for their work, it's right there. It's been there for nearly 30 years. And your response to the uh, complaint that there wasn't a checking of the source? The response is that there's no case I know of in the actual malice world that says that someone is required to go behind what is already considered to be a reputable source. In fact, the Reader's Digest case from the California Supreme Court says that if something is a reputable source, and we would submit in this case where you have a book that has been in publication for nearly three decades, that has been reprinted multiple times, as to which there is zero evidence that the plaintiff has ever complained about what Mr. Considine wrote about that conversation, that it can't possibly be the case that one is required to go behind that and to look for even more source material at the risk of having acted with, um, with, with actual malice. Um, last couple of things I want to talk about briefly on the false light claim before moving to, um, before moving to right of publicity. One is with respect to the claim that, that the, uh, the interview implies an endorsement or participation in, in the creation of feud. Again, I don't think there's any way that one could look at the, the inclusion of an Olivia de Havilland character, one of a number of characters who is seen as giving a few brief remarks before there are the, 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 the historical sequences that consume the drama, how that could possibly be taken by any viewer to, to say that Olivia de Havilland endorsed feud. There's nothing in any of the advertising. There's nothing in the presentation of the show that says this is the story as told by Olivia de Havilland. She's simply one of a number of narrators. We don't think there's anything defamatory about being associated with a major production which explores a relationship between Ms. Crawford and, and, and Ms. de Havilland's good friend, Betty Davis. And again, it doesn't come close. There's, there's no evidence that, of any sort of actual malice here. Again, quite night and day, we would submit 
between this case and the principal case that the plaintiff relies on for her endorsement theory, which is the federal decision in Eastwood versus the Enquirer, um, in which the Enquirer, which was presented itself as a newspaper, held itself out to be telling the truth, made it appear in the way it presented a story on the cover, in the use of its own editor's byline, in the choice of language, in putting a photo of Clint Eastwood's baby <laughs> in the picture that they had been given some sort of exclusive access and that there was some sort of an endorsement by, by Mr. Eastwood. Um, the final thing, I'd, not much to say about Frank Sinatra, <laughs> other than um, I, I don't think there's any way that a brief, literally a quip, in response to uh, Miss Davis, and we do know from the historical record that Miss Davis and Mr. Haviland spent a good portion of the night of that Academy Awards presentation in Frank Sinatra's dressing room. He was the host. The scene as a whole shows Mr. Haviland trying to buck Miss Davis's spirits. And the, in response to a, a claim of let's have a, you know, let's have a drink, where did it all go? For somebody to say, oh, Frank must have drunk it all, simply can't be, it doesn't convey any false statement of fact, and it doesn't write, come remotely close to the level of being defamatory, given the fact that Mr. Sinatra's well-known penchant for drinking was a part of his personality in Hollywood lore for decades. Again, no evidence of actual malice. Briefly, Your Honors, on the subject of the right of publicity, um, there are three potential tests that apply here. Under any one of them, the, the claims here simply cannot survive. Uh, the, the right of publicity claims cannot survive. One is the Guglielmi decision. Um, although a concurring opinion by Chief Justice Byrd, it's been recognized in the Comedy 3 decision itself it's been recognized in numerous Ninth Circuit cases, including the Share decision, that this was a decision of the, this, was, this constituted the majority of the, of, the, of the California Supreme Court. And what the, the, the case makes clear, and what the decision makes clear, is that prominence invites comment. That being a famous person, having played an actual role in history, invites one to make a story. That is a compelling narrative. As that opinion says, uh, it, it's entitled to as much uh, protection under the First Amendment as news reporting, given that with the benefit of hindsight, Dickens and Dostoevsky have told us more about the history of their times and things that happened and have, have made more of a contribution than any noted journalist of, of the time has ever done. And so it's, we would say that that, is, that case is squarely on point. And what it makes clear is that with respect to, and this goes to the, the claim that is advanced at greatest length in Mr. Haviland's um, reply to the amici brief, which that brief spends a lot of time on the right of publicity. And the position of the plaintiff is that the First Amendment really doesn't come into play unless you have transmogrified the character in history. Unless you have made Olivia de Havilland a half-worm creature of the type that was found in the Winter Brothers case, unless you show her performing or doing something at some outer space venue or some place that, that never existed, that, that she is off limits, absent her permission, that is, we would submit, an incredibly dangerous standard under the First Amendment. There are many, many living people who will continue to be alive for a long period of time, who play an important role in current events, who've played an important role in events over the last several decades. They simply don't have a veto right. And as Guglielmi says, no author should be forced by threat of a right of publicity claim to create mythological worlds or, or characters wholly divorced from reality. You have one more minute if you still I'm going to be very thank, six. thank you, Justice Edmund. Very quickly, under the transformative use test of Comedy 3, even if the, the, the plaintiff's claim is Googly Elmy doesn't apply, it was superseded by Comedy 3. Ignore it. Even though Comedy 3 cites Googly Elmy for these very propositions numerous times, 
But the plaintiff says you are in the world of transformative views. A few brief comments. The, the, the test on transformative views, Justice Moss' opinion phrased this in various ways. Ultimately, the question is, is the finished work, is the sum and substance of that the plaintiff's identity and likeness? Or is it the new author's own, is it their own contribution? Was Ms. de Havilland's name, her image, was that the raw material that was used to fashion a work, or was it the sum and substance? Was it responsible for the commercial success? We think under that transformative use test, this is, Ms. de Havilland's character was in the show for 18 out of 400 minutes. Um, Ms. De, Ms. De, there were numerous other actors. There was an entire script. This is not the literal imitation that the, that the Three Stooges case was. Finally, I'll just briefly summarize. California also has an exception for public interest, public affairs. It is, it, the plaintiff concedes that that also applies to her right of publicity claim. It is only superseded if uh, the plaintiff establishes actual malice, and for the reasons we described, we don't believe she has. I'll reserve the balance of my time. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. May it please the court, I'm Jennifer Rothman for the Amici Intellectual Property and Constitutional Law Professors. The right of publicity protects against exploitative uses of a person's identity. But when it's not properly cabined, it can shut down important speech about public figures in violation of the First Amendment. There will be difficult cases in navigating the boundaries of when the First Amendment protects uses of a person's name and likeness. But this is not such a close case. This is not an instance like Zucchini v. Scripps Howard Broadcasting in which the entire act of Ms. de Havilland was used, nor one in which there's a danger of disrupting her primary profession as there was in Zucchini. In fact, her performance was not used at all in the miniseries feud. Nor is this an instance like Comedy 3 v. Sat Gary Satterup, in which the primary product and value of the product sold was the likeness of the celebrity itself. We do not have a case here in which the name and likeness of Ms. de Havilland was mass produced on t-shirts or dolls and sold to the public. Instead, this is a case at the very heartland of protected speech, the depiction of people in movies, books, and news about true events. Because our brief lays out many of these points, I want to focus my comments on two points that were raised and highlighted in the response to the amicus briefs. The first is the application of the transformativeness test here, and particularly the distinction that's being made between literal depictions and realistic depictions, and I think it's important to keep those two very separate. Second, I want to highlight the importance of not letting the right of publicity be an end run around the very robust speech protections provided against false light and defamation claims, the actual malice standard, as well as the speech protections provided against false endorsement claims in the context of the depiction of public figures and expressive works, which has largely been uh, um, uh, used by the, the Rogers test, which looks at the artistic relevance and whether the use is explicitly misleading. So I want to start by focusing on the use of a real person's identity in a biographical motion fiction or television docudrama and analyzing that in the context of the transformativeness test. As counsel for effects mentioned, Guglielmi already suggests very clearly that biographical pictures are protected under California law that's been endorsed by Comedy 3 and Winter, as well as by this court referred to in Polydorus. But to the extent that this court thinks that an additional transformativeness analysis is appropriate, it's very clear that this is a transformative use. The California Supreme Court s emphasized that what you look at is that a use will be protected if significant creative elements are added, such that the work is transformed into something more than a mere celebrity likeness or imitation. That's clearly what we have here. De Havilland's name and identity are one of the raw materials of many from which a wholly new transformative work was made. 
both the trial court and the respondent made much of the realistic nature of the portrayal in de Havilland. But this is not a relevant question for the transformativeness test. It doesn't matter whether it's realistic or fantastical. What matters is if it's in service to a larger use. The crucial difference here is that there was, there was a realistic depiction, but not a literal depiction of Ms. de Havilland. She did not appear in feud. Instead, Catherine Zeta-Jones, an actress, plays the role of de Havilland and is part of the raw materials that make up this larger transformative expressive work. This would be a very different case if we had Catherine Zeta-Jones suing, uh, if she had not given her permission to appear in the miniseries and her performance had been reanimated and created by the filmmakers and then was billed as having appeared in the film. This reading of the transformative test in terms of the larger context in the way the identity is used fits with the understanding of transformativeness from copyright law from which it was imported by the Comedy 3 court. The focus in copyright law is whether it's transformative in the sense of being put to a new purpose or character of use. Is the purpose new or different in the sense that we're creating a new expressive work? Is it new in the sense of it's being used for a educational purpose or commentary? Um, as opposed to being a substitutionary identical use that would disrupt the market. Here, the miniseries feud did not seek to exploit or sell Ms. de Havilland, but instead to tell, tell a true story, one in which she played a real life part. This is exactly the sort of use that's understood to be transformative, both by the California Supreme Court and in the context of copyright law in a very similar analogous uh, form of analysis. The second larger point I want to address is that the right of publicity cannot be used as a way to do an end run around the speech protections. In almost every instance that a false light and defamation claim could be brought or a false endorsement claim, one could also bring a right of publicity claim. And if your false light and defamation claims are going to fail because you can't make the basic elements or actual malice or your false endorsement claim will fail because of the Rogers test, then you would just be able to turn around and win a right of publicity claim just because of the bare essential use of your identity. Hopefully you can see the great danger of such an outcome. The mere use of imagined scenarios and dialogues doesn't take this out of the transformative use test or out of the protections of the First Amendment. Allowing right of publicity claims solely because of the use of a person's identity and expressive work would be devastating for the creative arts, for filmmakers, but also for documentarians, biographers, and journalists, and mark a sea change in what I think is, all, is very clear California law that allows these sorts of uses and insulates them from right of publicity claims. The California Supreme Court has already weighed in on the dangers of allowing such an end run around false light and defamation law. Comedy 3, the court in Comedy 3 expressly raises this concern and suggests that the First Amendment would step in and, uh, and disrupt those claims. So describing real people and true stories of what happened to them is crucial in uh, both works of fiction and nonfiction. From We have many examples in our brief, but from biopictures like Feud and Hidden Figures, or The People versus O.J. Simpson, to biographies of Barack Obama and Elizabeth Taylor, to video games in which Manuel Noriega applies. And the other cases cited by uh, the plaintiff don't disrupt this danger. The examples, the, I think the two primary examples, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but that are, that are worth addressing are the Eastwood case, the California case. I know that counsel already addressed the, the federal case, but the, the California Court of Appeal Eastwood case is very different from this scenario. First of all, it predated the transformativeness test and the adoption of Comedy 3. Second, it was essentially a false light case in which actual malice was made. It could not be made, uh, I don't think it can be made here, but it was clearly made there in which there was a claim of an entire concocted news story set forth as true, as news in a newspaper. It's very different from a fictionalized docudrama in terms of what's being expressed. In addition, uh, it was clearly used to gin up sales for the newspaper. It was on the cover of the magazine. It was concocted to trade off of Eastwood's value. None of that is true of the miniseries Feud, which is in the context of telling a true story. The other case that I, I want to highlight is another California Court of Appeal case, the No Doubt case involving a video game. Um, 
which is also uh, referred to by the, the plaintiffs here. And that is also a very different case because the performance of the band, no doubt, was actually recorded and used in the video game, right? Again, here, Ms. de Havilland's performance is never recorded, never used, but in no doubt it was used. It was also, no doubt, was really a contract case in which there was an agreement that no doubt would appear in the video game under certain constraints, constraints that Activision then subsequently violated. And the, the First Amendment is no excuse for violating contractual agreements with a party to use their performance in a particular way. There was and an issue of exceeding the scope of the license? Absolutely, okay. yes. Yeah, it was very clear that that license said you could only use their performance with songs, no doubt songs, and there were, there were a number of other changes. They didn't want to be transmorgified, uh, and, and the video game allowed you to actually change their image to make it less realistic and also to be played with any of the songs in, in the game in express violation of the contract terms in that case. You have about one more minute. Right. Well, I think I've, I've covered most of the, the things I want to say, uh, so I'll just conclude with these final thoughts. We cannot recount historical events without referring to the people who participated them, nor should the people involved get to censor and control how their actions are later described. And that's true whether it's in news or documentaries or fictionalized biographical pictures or just straight out fiction. The right of publicity must have limits, and those limits are clearly met here. Right of publicity claims cannot be based on the bare inclusion of characters based on a real person in movies, television shows, or books. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Suzelle Smith, and I'm here today, Your Honors, representing Olivia de Havilland with Ms. Tremaine and Mr. Howarth, my co-counsel. Um, Mr. Havilland is very much alive. I know we have in the audience uh, first-year law students, and I recognize they're young. They may not understand that Olivia de Havilland is 101 years old, still alive, and a professional actress who won two Academy Awards. I think, Your Honor, that Your Honors, that there's one thing that everybody, all the counsel, all the amicus briefs, FX, Ryan Murphy. Everybody uncategorically agrees, categorically agrees, that Olivia de Havilland is a living icon. She is a professional. She is a public figure. She is a woman who is a legend. And she has a very well-defined reputation. Her reputation, unlike many others in Hollywood, and she left Hollywood when she was a relatively young woman and went to live in Paris, but her reputation, unlike many others, perhaps Betty Davis and Joan Crawford, for example, in Feud, is a consummate lady. She is restrained. She is well-mannered. She is a speaker of truth. And I hope that those values are not outdated today with fake news and lots of things that we see on television. Let me ask you this. Is there another thing that you agree on? Does everybody agree that <laughs> prong one of the anti-slap analysis was met? We do, Your Honor. So okay. we're on, we're on prong, two, prong, prong two. Given Olivia de Havilland's long career, I think it's also agreed that her name, her identity, and her character has commercial value, great commercial value. The reason Feud wanted to put Olivia de Havilland in the miniseries was because she's a recognizable figure to at least those over 50 years old, probably 60 years old. And there's a renaissance of interest in the Hollywood golden years. Those kinds of figures are coming back into vogue, and there's an economic incentive to it. That is a prop property right, which this court has recognized under the common law with the statute for many, many decades. There are a number of cases. You, you have huge briefs, I know. I, I read them all, and they're hundreds of pages, over 150 <clears throat> cases. I read them all over the last months. There's a vast store of information that's been given to you. This is an important case. It's important to the industry, clearly. You saw how many amicus briefs were filed. It's also important to Olivia de Havilland and other people whose names are taken and appropriated without their consent, who are celebrities who have that property right, 
and then on top of it to add false statements in their mouths, put into the mouth of a character who has the name, is designed to be, to look like and be as closely as possible the Olivia de Havilland. Well, Ms. Smith, let me ask you a question because your briefing sort of blends the false light claim, your false light claim and your right of publicity claims. If there were nothing in the docudrama that were inaccurate in its portrayal of Mr. Haviland, do you still contend that, that FX had to purchase or otherwise procure her rights to portray her at all, even if it were an entirely accurate portrayal? Your Honor, I think there are two, there are two prongs on this. The Eastwood case teaches us that if you appropriate the right, uh, the name and identity without consent for commercial advantage, and it's a false portrayal, then the right to publicity stands. If you take that away, I think we're then driven to no doubt, and we're looking at you have an accurate portrayal, which no doubt addresses this court addressed in detail, and it's not a contract case. That case turns on the right to publicity. Outside the contract, they, violate, they, they took it outside the contract, and they did unauthorized portrayals of No Doubt. But in No Doubt, my understanding is that the license, they licensed Gwen Stefani and her fellow musicians' rights to have them perform certain songs in this video game that you would play. They then used these avatars to have them sing other songs, other people's songs. So that was the falsity, according to the plaintiffs in that case. And as I recall, there was a concurring opinion by, I believe, one justice saying that he really thought this had to do with exceeding the scope of the license. But putting that aside, so, that, so it, it was an inaccurate portrayal of them. It had these avatars of them performing songs they never performed. So let's take a pure, what I'm trying to do is just is, is separate out your false light claim or your you know, arguments that she was portrayed inaccurately. If, if, let, let me ask you this question. If I were making American Crime Story, People versus O.J. Simpson, and my portrayal of Judge Lance Ito were entirely accurate, would I need to procure Judge Ito's rights? So the answer, I think under Eastwood is no, you would not. So the docudramist of the world and the documentary people of the world and the biographers of the world and those who write semi-historical fiction, Eastwood teaches us if you do a literal, accurate, non-defamatory portrayal, then you're all right under the law. The First Amendment protects that. The First Amendment does not protect appropriating the identity and the character of a living person. We're not talking about someone who's deceased. That was Googly and May, by the way. That was someone who was deceased. Not only was it not the opinion of the court, which the Supreme Court chose not to make the concurring opinion, the opinion of the court, they could have. They chose not to. The holding of that court was that if you're deceased, you have no rights of publicity at all, and that was later changed by statute. But, Your Honor, to specifically address your question, if it's a literal and accurate portrayal of the celebrity, then the First Amendment protects it. I agree with that. What if there's a fictionalized aspect to it, as in a docudrama, but that is not either defamatory or highly offensive to a reasonable person? You have to meet the actual malice standard. We accept that. We're here meeting the actual malice standard. And for this court, your job to decide is not who wins and who loses this case. The Amici and, and FX are acting like we're at a trial here and you're going to decide who wins and who loses. This is an anti-slap motion. Very important. We've had no discovery. We are on the pleading stage, and we came forward with evidence, admissible evidence. The record is as full as I can imagine of evidence that these were false statements. Forget about the gossip. These are false statements. She did not call her sister a bitch to, to um, Betty Davis. She did not do that. She did not say, even if you take the Robert Aldridge comment that, she says she didn't say, and you have to credit the plaintiff's evidence. Mr. Haviland says, I did not tell Robert Aldrich I won't play bitches, they make me so unhappy. She said that. Nobody says that she said, so call my sister. Call my sister the bitch, which we've already identified as a bitch, out of the mouth of Olivia de Havilland. So 
that statement is false. There's no evidence to the contrary that call my sister, I don't play bitches, call my sister, that that was ever said. She didn't talk about Frank Sinatra's drinking or anyone else's. She didn't give any interviews at Academy Awards or anywhere else where she talked about confidential information that she would know about Betty Davis from being her friend. Even their own declarations, the writer's declarations say, we knew that she was very circumspect about talking about private information. We knew she was very circumspect about talking about her sister and didn't do it except one time, which they hang their whole hat on, and again, you have to credit our evidence, but they say bitch and dragon lady are synonymous. We have expert testimony that that's not synonymous. Well, but isn't that for the court to decide, at least on an anti-slap? We have to de novo judge the work. You know, it's not like a trial court makes findings of fact about the work. I mean, going back to Learned Hand, there's decisions from, you know, the 30s that the court has to review the work to, you, at least at this stage. I mean, it might ultimately be a jury question of whether it's in a defamation case, but... The, well, you, you, do, you do view the work, but you do... You, use all the evidence in the record in order to view the work. And let me, let me just pause for a moment on view the work. Context is important. What does context mean? It doesn't mean, as counsel says, are there just a few statements in a bigger piece that are false, and so we get to dilute everything by saying true things, and then we say a few false things. Mason is clear on that. The United States Supreme Court interpreting California law is clear. You can have one statement that, that destroys the whole work if it's false, if it's knowingly false. And that's the evidence that we have is it's knowingly false. They admitted they fabricated it. Mason says a way to prove at the summary judgment stage, which was Mason, a way for the plaintiff to show actual malice, intentional falsehood is by a fabrication an admitted fabrication. In Mason, it was an article in the New Yorker where the author had some quotes, a long article, 99% true, accurate, five or six statements that were false. And what were they? Those statements we put in our brief because it's so important for this court to look and see what has been ruled by the Supreme Court and this court on what's defamatory. A professional. We have Olivia de Havilland, a professional. This is not just somebody in another context. She is a professional, and she is portrayed as talking about other professionals in a way that would hurt their careers if credited. And she did not do that. And they have no evidence that she, that she did that. So in Mason, it was um, an intellectual gigolo. And Mason had said some boastful things about himself and some things that were roughly the same way. And the author said, literary license. He closely said something like that. And the Supreme Court said, no, he did not say that. What, he, is, what does Zeta Jones say that would damage somebody else's career? Zeta Jones has her sister talking to other actors and directors calling her sister disparaging terms like a bitch. Oh, so you're saying she would, that statement would have damaged Fontaine's career? That statement would have damaged potentially Fontaine's career. And it would have also damaged Olivia de Havilland's career to be cast in the light of being so unprofessional, which is what Mason teaches. And also, um, I believe it's this court in the Bintram case where the psychologist, the, the, the novel was written, the psychologist's name was not used. It was fictional. But you could figure out who it was, and he did. And he said to one of the patients in a, in a session, drop it, bitch. Drop it, bitch. And he sued, and the court said, absolutely, that gets past summary judgment. He's a professional. It casts him in an unprofessional light. Is, is there a substantial difference between calling someone a bitch versus calling them a dragon lady? Well, there actually is, Your Honor. All right, if you could describe that. So, I, yes, um, and I'll try to be polite about it. Um, bitch, I think we could all recognize as a vul vulgar expression. I know it gets a lot of play these days, but in my household, if you say the word bitch, you get your mouth washed out. So there are, there are standards of propriety that bitch is vulgar. 
Dragon Lady is not a vulgar expression. Drag Dragon Lady has been used in books and novels. Madam Chiang Kai-shek was described as a Dragon Lady, not, not in any defamatory or deprecatory way, but a woman who is aggressive, yes. And Olivia de Havilland carefully chose the words after all the time went by and she was 100 years old. She was not 45 years old or 50 years old at the Academy Awards saying this, but she was 100 years old and she was pressed because her sister, one-sided story, had written and said many cruel things about her all their lives. It is not true that there was a well-known feud that went on between the two sisters. Olivia de Havilland kept her mouth shut until her 100th birthday. And when pressed about Joan Fontaine, who was by that time deceased, her sister is no longer alive, she's no longer in acting, and she says, calculatedly, carefully choosing her words, to use words that are polite, and respectful in the sense of not being vulgar, she says, well, my sister, as I've come to call her the dragon lady, had an astigmatism about some things which caused her to cause pain to some people. That was a calculated statement. If they had used that statement, we, would be, we wouldn't be here. If they had portrayed Olivia de Havilland as she was, rather than a person who talks about her sister as a bitch. Well, I mean, if, we were to, if we're to take the context into consideration, as you've indicated, how do you respond to the argument that if you, if you watch the whole work, uh, Ms. de Havilland comes across as sort of a, an ahead of her time, almost heroic character? It, do you disagree with that? We do disagree with that. We, we, our position is, and the position of our experts, that this was constructed. Court Cassidy, who's in the business, who's a writer, who's a screenwriter, fiction and nonfiction, says this was constructed to make her look unprofessional. But, but that's not a proper subject of expert testimony. That is legal argument in the guise of expert testimony. The court, there are plenty of cases, and I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with them, that say the court has to judge what does it mean, what does it say. You know, it's not proper to submit experts, somebody who says I've been in the business for 40 years and I think they were trying to portray her in a negative way. That's just not a proper subject for expert testimony. Well, th there, there, was no, there was no appeal on the admission of the expert testimony, which the trial court admitted, which, but our is, review is, de which, is, which is, I know, and okay. the record, and the record before you is, is what it is. But even if you choose to say, I don't want to see what uh, a writer uh, in the business would say about the way the character is constructed, the way the character is constructed is a woman who comes on, she is at the Academy Awards with her close friend to support, and she does an interview at the Academy Awards where she chooses the subject of I'm going to talk about my close friends and how they hated each other. Olivia de Havilland never endorsed that. She never said that Betty Davis and Joan Crawford hated each other. She never bought into that. She didn't go there. But Feud has her for their own purposes of sensationalism. This would be good. Let's make this better. Let's have honest, closed-mouthed Olivia de Havilland ladylike, saying that Betty Davis and Joan Crawford had a feud. They hated each other, and we love them for it. That wasn't true from Olivia de Havilland's perspective, and that is not something that she would have said. It made her look unprofessional. It made her look like she was a gossip who would reveal, if you don't like the word gossip, it was a person who would reveal confidential information about a close friend. And it was false. It was false. She did not do that, and she would not do that, and her testimony is to that effect. So if, if this court is going to create a new standard and say, well, back in the day we said drop it bitch was defamatory and, and caused a person to have a bad reputation, or at least enough to get past summary judgment. This is at least enough to get past the this case is frivolous, this case has no merit, if this case is frivolous and has no merit, there will never be. They say there'll be no docudramas. I, I think frivolous isn't the test, is it? I mean, you, without the merit, has to prove. Yeah, right. A without prima facie case, without merit. That's right. This this case would have to be without minimal merit, in the words of the California Supreme Court, in order 
to not survive the anti-slap motion. And in this case, this, in this case, the evidence in the record shows that the statements were made with knowledge that they were false. They are contradicted by Mr. Haviland as false. And they cast her in an untrue light, a false light, which is damaging to a profession and a, and a professional reputation. Can, can you focus on the evidence of actual malice? It's not clear to me what evidence. I understand it's your position, I think, that simply knowing that something was false is enough to make it actual malice. And, and I, it's, it's not my understanding that that's what the test is. The, so the, East, the Eastward Court, Your Honor, says that for right to publicity, it's a knowing falsehood. For the test under defamation, it's slightly different. It's not just knowing falsehood. It's a knowing falsehood that hurts your professional or could or has a tendency to well, hurt. It's not just could, is it? I mean, isn't it a subjective standard that they intended to convey the defamatory meaning? No, the, 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 the defamatory element is not clear and convincing evidence. The defamatory element is, does this have a tendency to hurt or harm a professional reputation. So the, the clear and convincing evidence, which, by the way, just one point on clear and convincing evidence. The trial court was absolutely right in the way that the court structured its opinion in looking at the evidence. The actual malice, the knowing falsehood, has to be by clear and convincing evidence, but only at the thres threshold stage. Did we show, did we show by admissible evidence that there's a probability that we will prevail on the clear and convincing evidence standard. And I know that's a little subtle, but it's important because if we have to prove our entire case here or at the trial court before we do any discovery, then you really have made an intrusion on the right to a jury trial. And we cite in our brief the cases that say a court cannot do that and has to be very careful. You can't weigh the evidence. You have to give the plaintiff all the credit and you can't you can't hold us to the same standard that we would be held to at trial after we've done our discovery. Without any discovery, we gave you evidence that the statements were false, that they were fabricated, and as the Mason court says, um, a fabric an admitted fabrication is evidence of actual malice. If it's an admitted fabrication, which they admit these things that they put in the mouth of, of Olivia de Havilland, were not said by Olivia de Havilland. I have two questions on that. One is that the trial court said at the oral argument that when counsel argued the clear and convincing standard said not only, not only rejected that, but said it would be reversible error for her to apply that standard on an anti-slap. And that seems to be incorrect, right? Okay, sorry, it's, then I'll well, ask no, question that, that two. Actually, Your Honor, was the point I was trying to make. I think that Judge Kendig First, you look at her, her order, but I think the comment that she made, which counsel agreed with, by the way, at oral argument, I think what she was trying to articulate was, it's not that I'm trying the case now at the anti-slap level. I'm not holding them to clear and convincing evidence as I would do at trial. I'm asking, do they, make, do they meet the threshold? Did they offer evidence that... Le that she tends to show that they can probably succeed on the clear and convincing ev evidence standard. Otherwise, if you affirm the trial court and rule de novo that we have proved by clear and convincing evidence, which, by the way, we think we have. They admit the statements are false. They do tend to injure her in her reputation and her profession. We have expert testimony in the record of that, and they don't deny it. But if you did that, you'd take away their right to a trial. I mean, they want a right to a trial, too. If, if you affirm the trial court and you give Mr. Haviland a chance to go to a jury, then we'll have discovery and they can argue that dragon lady and bitch mean the same thing if they want to put that proposition to, to a jury. But at this stage, you would have to hold as a matter of law that these knowingly false statements made, and, and Your Honor, I, I circled around back to your question of, of actual malice, they admit that the statements were not made by Mr. Haviland. They admit that they fabricated them. Those fabrications, as Mason teaches us, 
even if the author says, well, I really intended it to be a nice portrayal, and I really didn't see the difference between sex, women, and fun in Freud's house and sex, women, and fun somewhere else. That was one of the defamatory statements in the Mason case, that the article said that the psychologist, the Harvard psychologist, wanted to have sex, women, and fun in Freud's house. He'd said that he wanted to have sex, women, and fun in other houses, but they said, it makes a difference. It's Freud's house. He was a friend of Freud's. He was a confidant to the family. It makes a difference that he didn't say in Freud's house. She didn't say that about her sister. She didn't say that about Betty Davis. It makes a difference. She didn't say that about a fellow actor, a member of the profession. So here at this stage, Your Honors, you must, I know you know this, but you must put yourselves in the position of we're looking the, at this case in the, th in the threshold, and I agree it's a First Amendment, and Judge Kendig said she recognizes that there were very important issues here, which is why she spent about an hour at oral argument explaining her reasons and wrote a lengthy opinion going through every element of the causes of action, reciting the clear and convincing evidence standard, and outlining how and why the evidence showed that these statements made about Olivia de Havilland, a living person, were false, and, in, and knowingly false because they were fabricated. So on this record, with this evidence, there is a false light claim because there were statements fabricated that were untrue, that were rebutted by Olivia de Havilland. There are statements, even the one place where they say we've got the citation to the Considine book, which that book, if you look at that book, I know they filed all the books with you. Um, that book is heavily annotated. There are a lot of footnotes. There's no footnote to that statement. I just put that before you. There's no footnote to that statement. But that statement about I don't play bitches was contradicted by three articles that the defendants put into the record, the writers put into the record, where Olivia de Havilland was quoted as saying, I don't like to play evil characters. It makes me so sad, not bitches. And she certainly didn't say, go call my sister, because she never said that, and there's, that's not in the book, and there's no, there's no reference uh, substantiating, substantiating, that, substantiating that at all. I think you have to... The First Amendment is important, and nobody believes that any more than Olivia de Havilland does. But there's also, the First Amendment was designed and created to ferret out truth, to bring truth forward, not to protect fabricated lies about living people. So the First Amendment and the property right, property right to protect your right to publicity, the property right to protect your right to defend your own reputation, are important and they have to be weighed by the court. But the right to publicity and the right to privacy are clearly recognized rights in this court by the California Supreme Court and this court as important. And in this case, where we have falsehoods, where we have them done intentionally, where we have them done in such a way that it affects the reputation of a living celebrity, if, if this case cannot go forward past the anti-slap stage, you won't have a celebrity able to protect their, their right to control their identity, not to censor it, not to censor it, but to control it when it's done falsely, without support, without compensation, which the right to publicity allows. Will we have docudramas? Of course we will. What we need to have are docudramas that don't defame, that don't create lies, that stick to the truth. How, how is that not censorship? That, that the person who's being discussed gets, the, gets to make the call on whether or not you can make any discussion about me, whether it's right or wrong. So, Your Honor, as I answered, I think, your question before, the, the press or the biographer, or the fictional writer, or the filmmaker can make a film which is accurate. If they make a film which is accurate and does not lie intentionally, and we know there are falsehoods that slip in sometimes. The First Amendment does have a penumbra. You can innocently make a mistake. 
But as Mason teaches us, if it's a fabrication that you made up out of your own whole head as a writer or a filmmaker, then the inference there is that you knew it was false. That is the United States Supreme Court speaking to us. And we can prove intent by circumstantial evidence. Again, I circled around, I never answered your question. But not only do we have Mr. Haviland denying, not only do we have the writers saying that they made these things up, but we have the industry standard. That is not the only grounds for this case. No case says industry standard is just to be, it's not admissible or we're to ignore it. Those cases say, if that's all you have, it's, if it's just merely industry standard, that in the industry, the proper way to do this is to ask the permission of the celebrity who is alive, negotiate, negotiate, so that FX is, is telling this court they get 100% of the value of Olivia de Havilland's name and identity. They get 100% of that. She gets nothing. That's not what the law allows. There's a division. They do creative work. They should be compensated for that. Olivia de Havilland builds up a reputation for over 100 years with, as a celebrity and does the work that she does. She should be compensated for that. That's called negotiation. If they don't get her permission to say something off the reservation, then they have to stick, they have to, stick to the truth. And that we submit to the court both Mr. Haviland and her team, is a good thing. We want truth. We want accuracy. We don't want to promote lies. The law is a very high hurdle for a plaintiff in Mr. Haviland's situation. But where you do have a record that is as clear as this one, Your Honors, this case is a really an easy call. It, is, it gets past the Annie slap. All the things they want to talk about and argue, they can talk about and argue to a jury. But Mr. Haviland has shown a probability of success, clear and convincing on intent, admissible evidence that these were falsehoods, these were fabrications. They hurt her in her profession, and she should be compensated for that, and we should be allowed to go to trial. I don't know if I used up more time or I got so excited, but... <laughs> very, very close. Okay. 17 seconds over. All right. Well, if there, are no, if there are no further questions, thank you very, very much. And thank you very much for your um, expeditious treatment. Mr. Haviland is 101, and I think that stands for something. And she thanks you very much for moving this along so quickly. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. I'll be very brief, Your Honor. Um, with respect to the defamation claim, um, plaintiff's counsel spent quite a bit of time talking about the Masson against the New Yorker magazine case and why that sets the standard here. In fact, at pages 512 to 513 of 501 U.S. reports, Justice Kennedy's majority opinion says, in other instances, an acknowledgment that the work is so-called docudrama or historical fiction or that it recreates conversations from memory, not from recordings, might indicate that the quotations should not be interpreted as the actual statements of the speaker to whom they are attributed. He then went on to say, the work at issue here, however, an article in the New Yorker magazine, as with much journalistic writings, provides the reader no clue that the quotations are being used as a rhetorical device. Our case is exactly the opposite. It's the docudrama context. Not the, not the example of, of journalism. Um, with respect to the dragon lady bitch comment, one of the statements that plaintiff's counsel made was that it was inaccurate because it portrayed her as having made the statement about her sister at the Academy Awards. In fact, the only two uses of the, um, the word bitch were in private telephone conversations. Mr. Meneer said that he, they specifically structured it that way to be accommodating of the fact that they did realize that Ms. de Havilland was a person of discretion. And what he said was not that it showed her his intent, which is relevant to the actual malice standard here, was not to show that Ms. de Havilland was a hypocrite, but that she was a human being. And that, she, and that, in, in, that in, 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 in private moments with, with a close friend, she might say something that Lots of, lots of people do. Again, doesn't come close to, sati to, to satisfying the element of actual malice. A couple of statements, one of the, the statements that Justice Edgerton, you asked 
plaintiff's counsel whether there was a concession that if there was no false light, this would be uh, the, the right of publicity claim would fail. Plaintiff's counsel said that it would, and then immediately went to the Eastwood case. I believe what plaintiff's counsel is trying to say is that without the false light claim, without the claimed showing of actual malice, <laughs> under that case, there's a recognition that the claim would fail under the public interest, public affairs exception that, that we discussed earlier. Um, I think plaintiff is right about that. I think it also, the, the, the claim fails in any event other, under either Googly Elmi or the transformative use test. Uh, plaintiff's counsel said that the test under Eastwood, just taking the public interest, public affairs, the test is whether there is a literal and accurate presentation, that that's what the standard is. And in fact, what the Eastwood case says, and this is 149 Cal App 3rd at 423, 424, is not literal and accurate. It's our analysis must determine whether Eastwood has alleged the kinds of fault and the appropriate standard that may constitutionally warrant liability uh, in this case citing, um, you know, to the, uh, the Hill article on defamation and privacy under the First Amendment. Again, goes all the way back to the actual malice standard, which plaintiff is, still has no evidence to establish actual malice. Um, the other thing that, that uh, plaintiff's counsel said with respect to the Eastwood case is that um, the, the First Amendment is simply concerned with truth and that there's, it, 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 unless something is true, that, it, that that's the, the touchstone for the First Amendment. In fact, Eastwood itself, hardly the only case that says this, but at page 423, says all fiction is false in the literal sense that it is imagined rather than actual. However, works of fiction are constitutionally protected in the same manner as topical news stories. Finally, with respect to the no doubt case, which, which was discussed, um, there is a, there was, plaintiff's position here really blurs no doubt and blurs the property right that is at interest. What was critical to the courts holding in no doubt was that no matter where Gwen Stefani and the other members of the band were shown in the Guitar Hero game, they were performing their act. They were doing what they derived value from as a celebrity. This is not a new concept in the law. It goes back to the human cannonball case, the zucchini case. That the, what, the, what the US Supreme Court said in that case was that what made, the, what made the right protectable and made it trump the First Amendment in that case was that you had literally taken the performer's entire act. There was no reason for someone to go to the county fair to see him shot out of the cannonball if you'd seen it on television. Same thing with No Doubt, same thing with Keller, the video game cases. What those cases were about was protecting that by which Gwen Stefani and other people made a living, or what was the source of their fame in the case of Keller and the other, the other student athletes in the NCAA case. And here, the, the, the critical distinction is, Ms. de Havilland is shown, in, in the, the de Havilland character here is shown off camera. It's for doing what she did in real life, not her acting, not that by which she made her living. And with that, unless there are questions, uh, thank your honors for your time and respectfully submit. We have no, no questions. Thank you very much. The matter stands submitted.